Hi, this is Harshita Vijayavarghya and I am here today with a renowned cardiologist and pioneer in the field of coronary angioplasty, Dr. Jagdish Hiramat. Thank you sir, thank you for being with us. After the immense response we received on the special video presentation with sir on the topic lifestyle changes required to prevent cardiological disorders, we bring this exclusive interview to you to get answers to the questions we received from our member users on Doctexis related to preventive cardiology. So the first question that our users would like to ask is, what are the lifestyle changes do you think are required to keep our heart healthy? Yeah, I think this is a lot of common sense. Actually, all our grandfathers have been talking about it. We attach these big labels called the lifestyle change and denormishes program and other things. But it all boils down to correct diet, uh, regular exercise, um, being away from all the addictions, and of course, stress management, like trying to be happy. So if these four pillars are followed in the lifestyle change, then we are talking of a very healthy lifestyle, not necessarily only for the heart, but prevention or leading a healthy life is possible by leading this kind of a, a lifestyle. So diet will be in the form of eating for the body, not for the tongue. Like uh, we all know what are the items for the tongue and what are the items for the body. So if we maintain a 90 to 10 ratio, like we eat three times a day and 100 times in a month, so out of 100 times, 90 times if we eat for the body, 10 times we eat for the tongue, then we are having a nice balance and then you can still have a good diet pattern. At least 150 minutes of aerobic activity is required for exercise. That is 30 minutes, 5 days, which is not asking for too much really. Anybody and everybody should be able to do this. And stress management, of course, it's very individual, but having a hobby, having a good family life, having a good friend circle, uh, trying to train yourself to live in the present moment. These are all stress management techniques, really speaking. And then we talk of addictions. All of us know that tobacco is bad. So if we can prevent it. So again, I keep thinking that what is such a big deal about lifestyle? It is just that we have to implement it. We know what it is. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, how, if at all, yoga is important in prevention and stabilization of heart diseases? Yoga has been studied uh, paradoxically uh, very extensively abroad. It's not studied so much in India by way of how the allopathic um, truths come out in the uh, academic fora. Uh, transcendental meditation has been very well studied and it is very well proved that having a yogic way of life, the alpha waves in the brain go up. Alpha waves are actually peaceful waves. So they go up if you are practicing yoga or you are meditative in life. Yoga also reduces heart rate, which is very good for the length of life. It reduces blood pressure. So we have an allopathic medicine called beta blocker. It does all this, reduces heart rate, reduces blood pressure, but it comes with the baggage of side effects. Here is a natural pill, which gives you all the benefits without any bad effects of it. Yoga is also proved to reduce blood pressure very well. And Many other aspects like yogic way of life includes a diet, includes Surya Namaskar, which is aerobic exercise. So all the other parameters like your sugars, your cholesterol, all can improve if you follow a proper yogic way of life. So as you mentioned, Surya Namaskar is one. Any other yoga or mudra or exercise which is very important for heart health? See, if one goes through Patanjali, he never mentions any disease. He is talking of health. So, whichever way you learn, whether all yogic posture, there is pranayama, anulom vilom, or there is, uh, uh, shall we say, um, yoga nidra, which is like uh, uh, shavasan. All these, depending on the personality, suppose somebody is very hyper, then these cooling types would be very good for him. Somebody is a very low energy person, then I'm sure pranayama helps him a lot. So, it will have to be chosen by that particular yoga teacher. But whichever form it is, finally, if it is implemented effectively, it is going to have immense benefit on the overall life and especially cardiovascular diseases. So, 
वॉट इज योर लेटेस्ट एडवाइस फॉर इन टेक ऑफ एग्स एंड एल्कोहल फॉर जनरल पब्लिक इन सर्टन केसेज सच एस अ केस ऑफ सीवियर हार्ट डिजीज और अ केस ऑफ नॉर्मल लिपिड प्रोफाइल एंड अ केस ऑफ डिसलिपिडेमिया Yeah, actually, the advice is same for all. Really, uh, all of us have to lead a similar lifestyle. Uh, those who are having a problem may have additional tablets and medicines, but the basic lifestyle is same for all. It's like driving on the road. The safety rules are same for all the vehicles. Those who have met with an accident do not have separate safety rules. So, all of us should remember that we are about. allowed about 300 mg of cholesterol intake in the diet per day and one egg yolk contains 300 mg so if you eat one egg your quota for the day is over so if you are hyperlipidemic you are not even allowed that much so you are so that's why we keep talking of egg whites and not of egg yolk it is traditional wisdom that you know if you eat fat you are going to have high cholesterol liver produces cholesterol everybody knows it but our dietary contribution makes it worse for example somebody who has diabetes eats sugar his sugar is going to be absolutely high so if somebody has a cholesterol problem and he feeds cholesterol his cholesterol is going to be high so all of us should know that fats eaten in any form whether it is eggs or whether it is prawns or whether it is liver or it is brain all this is very very rich in cholesterol amongst the non vegetarian the white meat that is lean chicken um fish and um, white of eggs these are reasonable they are more proteins and less of cholesterol there is uh, some stray articles which come up and say that cholesterol is not the but this thing uh, culprit and other things but this is not an accepted truth it will come maybe after some years it might change because medicine is always work in progress it keeps evolving whatever we talked of 10 years ago may not hold true today but as of today we have to restrict fat there is no doubt we have to restrict carbohydrates also a lot alcohol is per se in moderation they say it's not bad that moderation is one large peg of whiskey rum alternate day is moderation or a beer glass of a bottle of beer alternate day is moderation but this is all true for western society in which they have alcohol every day for every dinner probably they'll have we are asking or those people they are asking them to moderate that means reduce those people like us who don't drink should not go on to moderation I mean, there is no need of starting alcohol if you are not alcohol but if you are fond of alcohol it should be in the moderation that means maximum of 3 to 4 large packs per week is all is allowed Uh, so that is for uh, alcohol alcohol per se is bad for the heart it can cause cardiomyopathies it can cause um, heart failures it can cause atrial arrhythmia so many things can happen because excessive alcohol consumed over a period of years talking of the diet it is suggested to consume raw garlic in breakfast so do you think it is really helpful and if there is any study for the reference not i mean garlic has been studied there is no doubt it reduces uh triglyceride a certain kind of fat in the blood but this triglyceride is not directly implicated in coronary artery disease so garlic is helpful but the quantity required is 60 grams uh, per day which is too much you know for the social circumstances so garlic should be in diet but it is nothing panacea that you consume garlic and you are free of everything no it is very very mild it has its good effect it should be in the diet but we should not rely on it to reduce your fats or cholesterol so brisk walk is suggested to patient who are who has severe hypertension but what would you suggest a patient who has severe back pain and is not able to attend for a long walk yeah i mean when has to find a practical solution for this um, so many patients are better off doing cycling because whatever is weight bearing suppose knees are a problem weight bearing walking will be a problem uh, suppose somebody has a hip problem then also weight bearing will be a problem back ache again weight bearing is a problem so where there is no weight bearing like shall we say stationary cycle so you bring it at home put it in front of the television keep cycling till you watch one half an hour program and it is done 
So you have to find a practical solution if you have a problem like this. But again, attaining 150 minutes per week is very important. Swimming is a great exercise again because it is non-weight bearing and it is good for back aches and other things. So, but how many people can do it and other things? What is our individual capacity? How are we surrounded? All this should drive what kind of an exercise you should choose. But you should exercise. So, do you think in the current circumstances, is it possible for the Indian private practitioners to follow preventive primary guidelines? Absolutely, because uh, as I said, this is common sense. It is also very much there in the literature, what are the guidelines. And each doctor um, for himself should follow this, first of all. He should follow it for his family. And he should follow it for people whom he is treating. Whether Even if he's a gynecologist, he can always... Uh, advice the families that she is treating about good lifestyle. Every disease, every disease, the treatment or the advice first starts with a lifestyle. So doctors, whichever doctor is, whether it's a basic doctor, BHMA doctor, Yunani doctor, uh, BMS doctor, all of us should be as a doctor community be very aware of these primary preventive lines and we should circle it in our own small circle. So if we, on the ground level, if you have these pockets of circle who are following lifestyle, then the overall pyramid of health will stand. Although if you divide, decide, depend only on the government to do some directly, it is not going to work. Completely agreed, sir. So, uh, sir, we can we really take chance by medical management or lifestyle changes without undergoing bypass surgery or angioplasty? And if yes, what would be the criteria to select such patients? Yes. Um, Whatever is acute, somebody has a heart attack, the treatment is intervention, whether it is angioplasty or bypass. If it is unstable angina, that means one step before heart attack, it is no question, it is intervention. Suppose somebody has got severe uh, angina, that means he cannot even take a bath, then that kind of a person also needs mechanical intervention, angioplasty bypass. But there is almost 30 to 35 percent population of coronary artery disease who have blockages, but they are known as chronic stable blockages. That means the person has some blockages, moderate blockages and all, but he can do his more day-to-day -day activity, he can go, con go out for a walk, he is on medication. These chronic stable patients are very, very carefully chosen for angioplasty or bypass because in them it is again and again proved that intervention in them may not be the best option. Just medical management is good for them. And if they have a thallium stresses which is reasonably good or if a treadmill stresses which is reasonably good, they are not facing side effects of the medicines. With minimum medication, if they are functional class 2, that means can go to office, can go for a walk, then they are very safe to be managed on just medication. Angioplasty will relieve symptoms. It is not going to control your heart attacks. Bypass surgery will control symptoms, but it will not uh, uh, going to prevent the heart attack. So, if you can manage symptoms by medication, then you are very safe. In these people, disease-modifying medication like statins or aspirins are very important. Symptoms are, in, it's like paracetamol for fever. All medicines are available, but whatever happens on a chronic stable plaque, to keep it stable or trying to reduce it, Trying not allowing to grow is what we should try with good dose of statin and aspirin and something in the research, maybe something might come up. But these medications will prevent blockages from getting worse. It is exceptionally safe to be on good medical management, optimal medical management, which consists of a good lifestyle and good medication for chronic stable angina patients. Yes, sir. Uh, so what are the basic lifestyle disorders and their management? Uh, in the past, a human being used to die of natural causes. For it was, it would be a snake bite or somebody had a fall, uh, somebody had a wound and it got infected or some such thing. So those natural causes slowly when the infections were overcome by antibiotics, they started getting reduced. Human beings started living longer. And after that, these lifestyle changes started <clears throat> coming into being. They are more related to sedentary lifestyle. In the past, man used to hunt his own food. 
Now he sits in one place and has food. So all the sedentary lifestyle which has come in, chronic stresses which have come in, then uh, let's say obesity which has come in. And all these lifestyle changes have led to a diseases like hypertension, diabetes, coronary artery disease. and These are all lifestyle. Even depression is a lifestyle disease. So these lifestyle diseases are now on the grow because the infections are less. And we are, as a developing country, facing this menace of these lifestyle diseases. Peculiarly, as affluence, urbanization, education goes on increasing, all these lifestyle diseases also go on increasing. But the developed countries like North America, Europe and Australia, New Zealand, they have now reducing their lifestyle diseases. And that is because of extreme form of awareness related to lifestyle, related to diet, related to smoking, related to cholesterol. It has percolated in the, their society for the last two decades. And you can see that they have a downward trend of lifestyle diseases. So what are your views then on interven indications for intervention in the light of Courage 2 trial findings? Yeah, Courage 2 actually talks of what I talked a little while ago. That means if you have a patient who is chronic stable and if you manage him very well on optimal medical treatment, which also includes good dose of aspirin and statin, and you could good lifestyle change, a good follow-up of parameters like you maintain their sugars, maintain their cholesterol, maintain their blood pressure, maintain their weights, maintain maybe their B12 and vitamin D, then these people can be very well managed on chronic stable angina patient can be managed on medication. On medication, on optimal medical, person gets symptomatic. He still gets angina. Obviously, he needs intervention. Failure of medical line of treatment is in one prime indication for intervention, whether it is Angioplasty or bypass is based on the patient's uh, coronary angiography. But it should be offered in the light of Courage 1 and Courage 2 as a good first option. We should not say, the, oh, medical management. It's, it's not that. It, by choice, you should offer them. In fact, Courage is the name which says, by Courage, you should offer them as a first choice. And if they don't do well on that first option, then you can go to the second option. So I strongly believe that yes, if you correctly diagnose a patient as chronic stable angina, your first choice should be good medical management. If it doesn't work, obviously the other choices are there. Uh, so one of our user member wants to pursue diploma in preventive cardiology since he's soon going to retire and wants to start his private practice in Amritsar. So do you really think it would be helpful for him being a general doctor? Remarkable because as I said, every basic doctor or every consultant, every super consultant must be a preventive doctor for himself, for his family, for his family, his, his social circle, his friends, they all, we all should be. And that's why uh, this gentleman's uh, uh, thinking process is very good. There are good courses available now uh, in which it, they are only e-courses, say about, <clears throat> say about 96 hours in a year. So two weeks, two hours per week, or just e-learning, and they can get a good certificate as a preventive cardiology doctor. So if they can, if he can do that, then he can be a much better doctor for the type of practice that he wants to do. When he's close to retirement, he will have the aura or the seniority to explain to people or influence people to lead a better life. So with this kind of scientific background, it's a wonderful idea to be a preventive doctor. Great. Then how do you see DocTexas as a mode to promote preventive cardiology? It's a great uh, way of promoting because uh, when I did this talk for preventive cardiology, I was myself very skeptical about what the, uh, of, uh, let's say the response would be. But I think uh, getting more than 2300 views for a 30 minute lecture was very good, extremely encouraging. So. It's a great platform to spread good news. So whatever is good, preventive cardiology is great news for the country. If you could spread it, well, people are there to lap it up. And I feel it's a very important program to reach to all the doctors of all specialties. Thank you, sir. Thank you for this insightful talk. I'm very sure that our users would be very glad to watch this conversation with you. Thank you so much again.